Today we, we begin a next journey in our chemistry class talking about the concepts of chemical bonding. We have a great background in understanding why atoms want to come together to form a more stable configuration with their electrons and in doing so forming one of three basic types of bonds. In our chapter, Chemical Bonding, we begin with a look at the three different categories of chemical bonds. We will spend time talking about ionic bonds, those that form between metals to nonmetals, electron transfer, where we have positive metallic ions bonding to negative nonmetallic ions, metal to nonmetal, where we think about charges when we write out our formulas, creating something known as a formula unit. These ionic compounds, we have a sample here, and I know the color isn't exactly bright in this picture, but we have potassium dichromate, nickel 2 oxide, magnesium oxide, all of these are ionic salts, our common term for those compounds known as formula units. Metals hooking to nonmetals by electron transfer. We'll then spend time talking about covalent bonds in which electrons are being shared. Sharing electrons between nonmetals, making these molecular compounds. Ionic and covalent bonds are two of the more common bonds in chemistry. We will also talk about metallic bonds, but only very briefly. Those metallic bonds that cause the conductivity of, not, of metals to be highly conductive elements. The metals atoms bonded to several other atoms creating this sea of electrons that create a, a huge current when zapped with an electrical power source. Ionic, covalent, and metallic bonds. Again, metallic bonds will be just briefly mentioned. The big focus, a little bit on ionic, but truly the biggest focus in the course will be on the covalent bonding and drawing the molecular structure. And friends, even kind of looking ahead to our next chapter, chapter 9, which is called molecular geometry, we'll start taking a look at how not only do the atoms bond together to create these compounds, what is their molecular shape in turn of a three-dimensional geometric shape? So 8 and 9, our next two chapters, really do spend a lot of time focusing on covalent bonding. We begin by talking about Lewis dot structures. Lewis symbols are sometimes simply known as electron dot structures. These dot structures were invented, if you will, as just a way of bookkeeping by G. N. Lewis. Lewis is the chemist that's often associated with acid-base chemistry as well. The electron dot structure simply is a bookkeeping way to show valence electrons, just a little dot placed around the symbol of the element. So any element X, we know to place one dot associated with the S2, P6 configuration. Those are the elements, or those electrons in any atom that would be considered valence electrons. The S2P6 configuration forming what we call as an octet rule with every atom wanting to achieve eight electrons in its outermost shell. So as an electron begins to fill the energy levels, remember how the S2P6, we are used to just seeing one dot around each electron or one dot around the symbol first, one, two, three, four, and then we go back and associate partners, five, six, seven, eight. And now we have what would be considered a noble gas arrangement if we indeed have eight valence electrons. One dot around each side first, then I go back and assign partners, where the, where the number of dots is associated with the number of valence electrons that any atom would have based on where they live from the periodic table. Valence electrons, if you remember, just simply for the group A elements, match the group number that they live in. We discussed that the octet rule drives the number of electrons that either be lost, gained, or shared as they start to try to achieve the eight valence electrons of the noble gas. The octet rule simply stated says every atom wants to have that noble gas configuration S2P6, achieving the eight electrons that a noble gas except for helium. Helium fills at just the S squared. But all of the larger noble gas atoms do achieve the octet. 
And the goal of every atom is to either lose electrons, gain electrons, or share those electrons to achieve the S2P6 configuration of the subshell of the noble gas. Now there are many exceptions to the octet rule, but it is a great foundation for predicting the vast majority of the way that compounds form, either through ionic bonding or through covalent bonding. The S2P6 configuration will dominate our prediction, but of course to any rule there are some exceptions. And it's towards the very end of our lessons in Chapter 8 that we start looking at the noble gas arrangement that break the octet rule either by having fewer than eight or sometimes even more than eight electrons around that central atom. We begin then with the discussion of ionic bonding. Remember that ionic bonding is a metal which forms positive ions by losing electrons hooking to the nonmetal, which forms negative ions creating an electrically neutral compound. Ionic bonding is an electron transfer where metals lose and nonmetals gain. Using Lewis symbols to represent a reaction that occurs between a magnesium atom and a bromine atom to form the compound of magnesium bromide. Find magnesium on your periodic table. Do you see how its symbol, Mg, has two valence electrons? Magnesium, if you were to write its configuration, would have neon in a bracket. That's the last noble gas you would pass through. And you would write 3s squared. Magnesium lives in the third period, group 2a. It has two valence electrons. So those two valence electrons will be represented with dots around the structure. Any of the sides are fine. We just use not the same side until each one has a partner. We want to react that with bromine. The element bromine, Br, now thinking where bromine lives, it also has a noble gas arrangement, argon, the last one you pass through. But now it passes through 4s2, 3d10 to get to bromine. And then it is 5 over in the p block, so we would write 4p5. Bromine clearly has 7 valence electrons, 2 in the 4s, 5 more in the p shell, giving us 7 dots. And easily determined because bromine lives in group 7a, 7 valence electrons. So we will show those 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, one around each side first, 5, 6, 7. Now here's what we can determine so far. Magnesium clearly has to lose two electrons. Bromine only has room to gain one. So, so far we could see an electron transfer between one electron from magnesium and satisfying this bromine. But what do we do with this second electron? And of course you've stated, well what we'll need to do is clearly draw in the second atom of bromine. And when we draw the second atom of bromine in, now we have a place to deliver that other electron there for our magnesium. So let's draw that in. We'll draw a second symbol for bromine. One, two, whoops, let me make that neater. And I'll go back to the blue color to keep it color coded. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven dots originally from the bromine because it's seven valence electrons. We will then kind of just think about click and drag. Drag that second electron over here and arrive at bromine. Alrighty. So this, by the very definition, is an ionic bond. It is an electron transfer from the metal to the nonmetal. And what have we created? Well, we've created a magnesium ion. It's now carrying a positive two charge. The positive two charge, because we've lost both electrons, and we've now created a bromine with eight electrons around it. We have two of them. And any time we have an ion, you'll see it placed in a bracket when it's gained or lost electrons. So I'm showing two those are dots. 2Br negative 1 ions. 
metals will never have dots. They want to get rid of their electrons. They will have positive ions with no dots around them. Over here, the nonmetal bromine has achieved its octet by gaining that electron, now carrying a minus one charge. These will always have eight dots for the nonmetals. Metals will lose to achieve the octet. Nonmetals will gain. Of course, the compound itself would be written MgBr2, showing a neutral compound known as magnesium bromide. Very much a review from our first year chemistry course when we first learned about ionic compounds and electron transfer. The goal of the metals is to lose to achieve the noble gas, and the goal of the nonmetals is to gain to achieve its noble gas arrangement. Thinking about that a little bit deeper, we're asked to write electron configurations for the following ions and determine which would have noble gas arrangements. For instance, the strontium ion, strontium carrying a plus two. An atom of strontium, if you find strontium on the periodic table, it is number 38. So there are 38 electrons to write for strontium. If you were to find the last noble gas for the atom of strontium, it would be krypton, so in a bracket I could write krypton. And notice what would come next, 5s2. The positive 2 ion of strontium loses those two electrons. These are the very electrons that are lost to achieve the noble gas arrangement. So the ion of krypton is simply the noble gas arrangement of krypton. That's it. You could write it all out, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10, 4p6. That would be the arrangement. And most of the time you'll actually see that written out, 1s2, write it with me, good practice. 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10, 4p6, and now we clearly see the octet rule has been achieved by losing the 5s2 arrangement. So longhand or shorthand is indeed fine. This indeed has the noble gas arrangement of krypton. What about titanium carrying a positive 2 charge? Where is titanium, Ti? If you found titanium, it is number 22 on your periodic table. What would the configuration for titanium look like? Let's write it longhand. We'd have 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d, and how many over is it? 1, 2, 3d2 is the configuration longhand for titanium. Of course, the core electrons would end with the noble gas of argon at the end of the third row. So the other choice is argon, 4s2, 3d2. So here's the neutral atom, but clearly we're told to make it lose two electrons. The positive 2 charge here says lose 2 electrons. Now here's the choice. What would be the outermost energy level? The 4s squared or the 3d2? We are absolutely right. The 4s2 is the outermost energy level. See the 4 is at a higher energy level than the 3d2. Even though it fills first, 4 is the higher quantum number. So this is what will get erased when we write out the configuration for the ion. So to get rid of the 4s squared, and we could just do that by kind of crossing it out, 4s squared is now eliminated to become the positive 2 ion. And my final answer would be argon's configuration, 3d2. This does not have a noble gas arrangement as in the first example of scandium. Scandium, we erased 5s2, landed right at krypton. 
But here's an example where we erase the 4s2, there's still electrons in the d sublevel, not the noble gas configuration. What about selenide? Here the i, d, e. This negative 2 charge is telling us to gain 2 electrons. Negative ions gain. Well, where is selenium? Selenium is number 34 on the periodic table. So we'd have to write for 34 electrons. Let's do that. We have 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10. And to get to selenium's box, we have 1, 2, 3, 4 over. So 4p4 is the atom of selenium. We need to gain two electrons. Where will they go? We well, are exactly right. Instead of 4p4, we now take that 4 and change it to a 6. We simply add the electrons into that energy level that's not filled. 4p6 now fills it, and we have indeed achieved the noble gas arrangement of krypton. This does have a noble gas arrangement. It's following the octet rule, 4s squared. I know those look like 9s, but they're 4s. 4s squared, 4p6. That indeed is a noble gas krypton. How about nickel? Nickel with a plus 2 charge. Nickel is number 28. We could try one shorthand this time. Who's the last noble gas before nickel? It's indeed argon. Argon in a bracket. We pick up with 4s squared, 3d8. Nickel is 8 over in the d block. I'm having a hard time with my 4s today. There, 4s squared, 3d8. Here we see clearly that nickel is going to lose two electrons, the loss of two electrons. Where will it come from? The outermost energy level, the 4s2, is the one that they're taken from. 4s2 is eliminated. And so our configuration for the ion becomes argon 3d8. This is not a noble gas arrangement because of the d sublevel. And we'll work one more to finish our first page of our new note pack. Bromide, Br negative 1. Bromine, the atom, is number 35. The last noble gas we would pass through is argon, AR, and we would pick up five, oops, I went too far, we're in four, fourth period, so 4s2, 3d10, 4p5. Clearly we see there's an empty orbital in the p sublevel. Thinking about the negative 1 charge here, the negative 1 says we have to gain an electron. And where will it get placed? Right here in the 4p5. So we can change that from the 5, make it turn into a 6. And now we see indeed that we have a noble gas arrangement, 4s squared, 4p6. We've just written actually 4 krypton. Alrighty. So yes, this does have a noble gas configuration. So in our first two sections of our new chapter, we've talked about Lewis dot structures and how we have ionic bonding. In a previous lesson, we said here magnesium lost, bromine gained to achieve noble gas arrangements. And really, that's exactly what this particular set of practices were doing, looking at the exact electrons that are either being lost or gained to achieve the noble gas arrangement. We're also seeing kind of a prelude that there are some times where the octet rule is not being followed, and those are for those transition metals that have D sublevels.